Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. While Cornell Medicine's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology is pleased to present the next installment of our webinar series in the middle, Managing Your Midlife Transition. Tonight, our speakers are Dr. Susan Lowe, MD, FAC, NCMP, and she's also an NAMS certified menopause practitioner. And she's joined by cardiologist Nevi Amin, um, and they are going to discuss what you want to know about women's heart health and menopause. We invite you to submit your questions in the Q&A section, and a recording will be sent out in the next few days. It is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Loeb. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us this evening for such an important topic during Heart Health Month. As um, as you might know, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women. Many women are not aware of that. The menopause transition is a critical time for cardiovascular health when we see changes in women, um, sometimes negative changes in their cardiovascular health, including their lipids, their blood pressure, body mass index, body composition, and glucose metabolism. Also, many women during this time period struggle to maintain ideal health behaviors, which can be very preventative for cardiovascular disease. So during this webinar, we'll discuss women's cardiovascular health, risk factors, some tips on what we can do to decrease our risk of heart disease. So I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, an expert in women's heart health to enlighten us on this topic this evening. Dr. Nevi Amin is a cardiologist on faculty at Weill Cornell Medicine. She founded and directed the Women's Heart Program and currently focuses her efforts on digital health innovation to improve patient outcomes with Bristol-Myers Squibb. She continues to publish and speak on the topic of women's heart health and hopes that her efforts will culminate in an improvement of the health outcomes disparities seen among women. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here with you. So let's just start really generally. Who's at risk for heart disease? A basic question, what are our risk factors? Who's at risk? Well, we all know about traditional risk factors. Um, age is actually one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease. So as a person ages, um, the risk for heart disease increases with time. But certain risk factors such as cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, overweight or obesity status can increase one's risk for heart disease. And what is emerging um, in our research and our literature is that there are often certain risk factors that are unique that can increase one's risk for heart disease. And in women, um, that can be potentially pregnancy complications such as preeclampsia, high blood pressure, diabetes during pregnancy, or even premature menopause. So menopause happening well before the age of uh, 45, often below the age of 40, um, as well as certain autoimmune diseases, which uh, often happen in women more so than men. And finally, um, certain therapies that are used for um, breast cancer, or ovarian cancer treatment. So there are a multitude of risk factors for heart disease, but the good news is that when people give attention to um, to these risk factors, there are ways to mitigate that risk. Yeah, that sounds good. We'll talk about a lot of these things um, going forward, but another risk factor I think is your family history, right? So how does that play a role? And one of the questions that came in before the webinar was, is it the same risk if your mother or your father had heart disease? The, um, that's, that's a really interesting way to put that question. Um, but family history is an important, critical, uh, key component of um, heart disease risk, especially if one of your um, parents or even grandparents had heart disease at a very young age. Um, it really doesn't matter if it's your father or your mother. I often see women whose fathers had heart disease um, at a young age and conferred that risk to their daughters, for example, um, and, and vice versa, women, men. Um, the main thing to look at is whether, number one, um, any 
first degree relatives, so parents or siblings might have heart disease at an early age or even at age appropriate. So what are those cutoffs? Um, generally in women, we see heart disease manifesting after the age of 65 and in men over the age of 55. So if they're having heart disease before then, that's a critical um, point to remember. And additionally, understanding if your family members had special risk factors that might have put them at increased risk, um, and especially if you share some of those particular risk factors. Yeah, it's important part of our history taking to kind of talk about what 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 our families have, what our parents had, our siblings. Yeah. So, um, what symptoms should we look for when we're talking when we're concerned about whether or not we have heart disease? I know some of it is very silent, right? But if if we experience certain symptoms, what what is alarming? What should we be looking for? If somebody is experiencing symptoms of new fatigue um, with certain activities, so let's say you can usually run for that M31 or M15 bus to get up to Cornell, um, and now you're finding that it's tough to do that or go, it's harder to go up a flight of stairs because of new trouble breathing, maybe a little bit of chest discomfort, um, maybe some numbness or pain up the neck, even just feeling inexplicably tired with your usual activity, that may be an early sign of heart disease. Some of the classic symptoms of heart disease that um, is related to the kind of um, process that leads to a heart attack or heart disease related to atherosclerosis are symptoms such as chest pressure, especially at times of stress or um, activity, exercise, um, sometimes people feel symptoms within their chest, sometimes in the upper abdomen. There may be sweating with those episodes, uh, nausea. Sometimes people feel that sensation go down one side or the other or up the jaw. The important thing is to notice if you're having some new symptoms or worsening symptoms that, that seem to just not be getting better. Yeah, for sure. And how about that blood pressure that we check in the office and, you know, people say it's white coat syndrome. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, but often blood pressure goes up in the, in the doctor's office. So if that, if blood pressure is a concern, it may be uh, time to get a blood pressure monitor, um, have one at home and sit quietly for a few minutes in a comfortable position and check your blood pressure to, to monitor on your own. What I'll say, though, is that being at the doctor's office may be a stressful experience for some, but we experience stress all the time. So if the blood pressure is going up at the doctor's office, then chances are at other times when you're stressed or rushing around, the blood pressure may be elevated. So keep an eye on that. Uh, don't let somebody uh, dismiss that. Uh, make sure that you keep an eye on it for yourself. That's, how, that's what I would recommend. Oh, for sure. I think those home kits are perfect so that when you're feeling stressed, you can see is my blood pressure going up too. Yeah, absolutely. I meant to ask you, so some of the symptoms you talked about, are they different in women and men? And should we, um, women be on alert for something that is not as, um, you know, that we typically think of with heart disease? Yeah, so the classic symptom that um, that what that used to be described in the in the textbooks was the sensation of pressure over the chest, an elephant sitting on somebody's chest. In women, sometimes women have those symptoms. The symptoms sometimes they don't. Um, more often than not, women present with um, with a spectrum of symptoms, and it may not always be with chest pain. So it's important to know what sorts of activities may provoke that if the symptom is coming on with less and less activity, or if um, the symptom's just not going away and you're feeling, and an individual's feeling worse, um, you know, and there's a lot of sweating or nausea or just having trouble breathing, get to the emergency room. Don't ignore it, um, even, if, you know, even if it comes without that classic chest pressure, chest tightness feeling. So this is a question that just came in through the audience, but also it's a great question because I'm even stumped by it sometimes. Who should I be sending to a cardiologist? Who should be seeing a cardiologist? Uh, well, 
that's a great question. So I think people who know that uh, there are a few categories. So in, in patients who are not having symptoms, um, cardiac symptoms, and I'll go through that list in a minute, but, but patients who aren't going through, who, who don't have symptoms, but who have risk factors for heart disease and maybe multiple risk factors, maybe a good idea to speak with your primary doctor or your OB, um, your obstetrician gynecologist about whether you should be seeing a cardiologist. But certainly those individuals who are experiencing symptoms and um, new or worsening symptoms, such as chest pressure, chest pain, chest tightness, trouble breathing, palpitations. So palpitations are an inexplicable sensation of the heart beating fast, for example, or skipping a beat or having irregularity. Maybe an individual notices that they're feeling new dizziness or new faintness that didn't occur before. Before These are some symptoms that may be associated with, with heart disease, and those um, women should definitely see a cardiologist. So that's an interesting one, because sometimes we see palpitations in association with hot flashes. So how do we decipher? Is it heart disease? Is it hot flashes? Is it, um, do I need to see a cardiologist? Yeah. You know, um, I think that if the palpitations are longstanding and perhaps they're getting worse with hot flashes, um, then then certainly um, a time to say, okay, maybe I should see a cardiologist because I've had palpitations and now I have another trigger that's making them worse. Maybe those palpitations were something that needed to be checked out already. But let's say the palpitations come on with hot flashes and the hot flashes improve and the palpitations improve, then it was probably just time limited. But if those palpitations continue or worsen, despite best treatment of the hot flashes, I would recommend seeing a cardiologist. Yeah, great advice. Um, you, we spoke about, you know, people symptomatic should see a cardiologist. Preventatively, I think also strong family history, especially that early age onset, right? And you said, people with a couple of risk factors maybe want to check in with a cardiologist. Is that preventatively? Is that is that uh, correct? That's absolutely right. And some of the key risk factors to look out for, um, I'd encourage um, women to know their numbers. So know what your cholesterol is, know what your blood pressure is, know what your body mass index, which is a ratio of height and weight. Um, know some of those. Those are key risk factors for heart disease. Um, know what your blood sugar is. Um, those are diabetes and high blood sugar can be risk factors for heart disease. Additionally, understand your patterns, your home, your, your, your self patterns, your sleep pattern, stress. Um, some of these are not as measurable um, as the blood pressure or the blood tests that you can take in the office visit or even the weight as much as we don't all want to step on the scale. The sleep and stress um, are also key risk factors to, to keep an eye on um, and, and discuss with your physician if, if one or more of these are kind of out of, out of range or, or you're concerned about them. Yeah. So I want to get to um, the menopause transition and the changes, but in terms of screening tests, are uh, you know we know blood pressure, lipids. Um, what about this calcium score? Who should get one of those? I would recommend a calcium score, and I'll explain what that is um, in a minute. Um, but I I would recommend a calcium score to women who might have borderline cholesterol results. Um, who are trying to understand how aggressively to treat their cholesterol, whether with medication in addition to diet and exercise um, uh, measures. Um, so a calcium score is basically a test to look to see if plaque or that fat buildup in the blood supply to the heart um, has hardened enough to create calcium. So fat deposits or um, cholesterol deposits in the arteries of the heart can cause blockages and narrowings, and they can also rupture and cause heart attacks. As that plaque ages or as that fat ages, it becomes calcium, which can be detected by a CT scan. Um, and that CT scan is 
is similar uh, amount of radiation as somebody taking a transatlantic um, flight. So in some individuals, it may be a relatively low risk test to understand whether that individual has um, mature plaque in the arteries and additional reason to potential to be more aggressive with cholesterol management. Um, we, we don't recommend doing these serially like every year, but sometimes if a person has no calcium and we're not yet deciding on the cholesterol management strategy, we might repeat it after a certain period of time. So you're saying it's based on your cholesterol more than any age specifically, yeah? Yeah, I would, I would recommend um, over the age of 40, if an individual has significant risk factors that they're um, looking to modify. But the real um, question, and I'll add this too, is sometimes the cardiologist will use that number um, if calcium is present to decide whether or not an individual should start cholesterol therapy mm -hmm. and whether or not an individual should start chronic aspirin therapy. So after a certain cutoff, um, after a high enough number of calcium, that risk for um, heart attacks is similar to somebody who's had a heart attack already and aspirin may be recommended. Interesting. Yeah, it's becoming more popular to do this test, so it's good to know who should get it. It is, and and you know the the challenge is that um, the while there's data, it hasn't been written into the formal guidelines. And I think until we get to the point that the these tests are written into the guidelines and the way that mammograms or colonoscopies are, we're still going to have this you know art of medicine approach where we're going to look at the individual in front of us and decide um, with with our patients. Um, who needs a calcium score, who doesn't. Yeah. Okay, so we want to talk menopause. So menopause slash age-related changes in women. We see some, some things are hormonal and some things we see in our bodies are related just to our age. So there are changes in our body that happen as we go through menopause and in our um, in our lab values and everything. So start, let's start with our body mass index, our fat distribu distribution, and our body composition. Um, we know that there are changes, right? We get this um, visceral de deposition of fat, right? And that can increase our risk for cardiac disease in some ways too, right? Yeah, this um, this deposition of fat and around the organs and around the middle is more of a male pattern of our fat distribution, actually is what it's called sometimes in the literature. But um, that, that fat deposition is um, metabolically active in the sense that it has a different characteristic and different infl inflammation um, component than other types of fat deposition. So the, the two key ingredients that I tell my patients um, are needed for, for plaque um, to build up in the arteries and increase one's risk for heart disease or increase one's risk for a heart attack are um, excess uh, cholesterol in the blood. So too much cholesterol for your body and inflammation. And those two ingredients together contribute to one's risk. And this particular fat deposition is highly um, inflammatory. Yeah, many of our patients, many women do complain about how the body changes during menopause. And we do see that kind of deposition in the midriff. And that is just, you know, working on that and diet and exercise and um, resistance training are all things that can be helpful for that deposition for sure, right? Absolutely. That, that um, the key is trying to maintain that, um, those great habits through menopause because it's going to matter just as much, if not more, uh, mm -hmm. during the menopause transition. And that's that also is a risk factor for um, our glucose metabolism. Um, as as that body changes, we lose some of our ins we get some insulin resistance, so we're um, we have poor glucose metab metabolism, and that's a risk factor also. Correct. That's right. So metabolic syndrome is a um, is the phrase we use for this this not just related to menopause, but anybody who is developing um, 
impaired glucose metabolism, obesity, um, or overweight, especially in certain distributions and other characteristics. And these are risk factors for diabetes. And diabetes itself is an independent risk factor for heart disease, vascular disease, and, and a whole slew of other um, conditions. So the, the, the best attention we can give is to try to keep the weight in a normal range, stay active, um, and, and reduce any excess calories in our diet. For sure. So that's why I started this, this, this line of questioning with it's both menopause, hormonal and age related changes, but they work together. Just like as women go through menopause, we see changes in their um, lipid profile, right? We definitely see LDL lipids going up. Um, I've had patients say to me and I've observed as a clinician, I, you know, I, I, Dr. Amin, I woke up one day and all of a sudden my cholesterol is up and I'll also insert blood pressure here. Mm -hmm. There is just such a rapid change that can occur during menopause that I, I really do recommend that women keep a close eye for themselves and also with their, their doctors, um, close eye on their blood pressure, cholesterol, weight. Um, and because a lot of what's been protected throughout a woman's um, uh, lifespan, you know, as she as she reaches reproductive age and then into uh, the menopause transition is estrogen. Um, and and there are certain protective effects. But additionally, um, as women go through menopause, that um, that beneficial effect of estrogen together with increasing age just makes it that much more difficult to manage some of um, some of the cardiac risk factors like cholesterol, blood pressure, and weight, and vascular function too, right? The the actual the thickness of the vessels we have, right? Yeah, so this vascular biology is just so fascinating. I mean, the, the blood vessels are an organ into, uh, of themselves, and um, estrogen just plays an incredible role in how the blood vessels dilate um, or constrict, mainly dilate, but how they respond to stress or how they respond to biologic needs um, in the body. Yeah. So let's talk more about hormones because that's, you know, everybody wants to talk hormones. New York Times is talking about hormones, which is awesome. So let's, um, let's just talk. So we know, as you already said, and we know estrogen does play such an important role in cardiac health to the point that if a woman does go through um, early menopause, especially as you already said, before the age of 40, we s strongly recommend if they can take estrogen and largely, I mean, also for bone health, but also largely for cardiac health. Um, and so the recent article in the New York Times really spoke about the evolution of hormone therapy over the past 20 years. When that Women's Health Initiative study came out, and was supposed to be this study, this huge cohort study was supposed to show protection for cardiac health and showed increased risk of cardiac health. But what, but, um, but what we've learned over um, the 20 years since that, 21 now since that study came out, is that if we start hormone therapy within the first 10 years of menopause and start it before age 60, we actually have, um, the cardiac profile is really good. Whereas if we start it later, then it increases the risk of heart disease. So I was wondering if you could speak to that and explain in the context of some of the things we just discussed, why that is the case. You know, the, there there is an increased risk for um, having too much estrogen exposure um, through the lifespan. And that's where some of the risk starts increasing if estrogen is used well beyond the natural biological um, term. Um, and that is generally up to the age of 60. And so, and, and in some women, it can be extended slightly beyond that, depending on one's um, risk factors and, um, and, uh, and needs and their symptoms. But with monitoring, I think it's really helpful and beneficial for women to, um, to address symptoms associated with um, menopause. And additionally, um, we do see that if 
Premature menopause is an independent risk factor. Menopause itself is a risk factor for heart disease. And we have to weigh that risk with um, the potential risk of excess estrogen exposure. So what, what can excess estrogen do for women who are taking it um, too long or beyond um, what their body needs? It can increase, it can actually paradoxically increase one's risk for stroke. Um, can also increase one's risk for certain types of cancers and also for blood clots. So these are not, you know, minor kinds of things. Um, and so I would recommend that we we really consider the balance between um, potentially starting a woman with symptoms um, on hormone replacement therapy and having a time limited course of that therapy. And if the woman has, um, if she has increased cardiac risk, then those risk factors need to also be modified at the same time that hormone replacement therapy is given. What do you mean by that? So let's say you go in um, with elevated blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, the hormone therapy itself will not likely um, change some of those factors or may not change some of those factors. Um, potentially with lifestyle, of course, um, those can change but they may need to be monitored and treated even if a woman starts um, hormone replacement therapy. Sure, so you might need to go on a statin or something for your cholesterol if- in Exactly. Addition. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I do think, um, I totally agree. And I do think that we are generally at a point if you don't have other risk factors that um, speaking just for heart health, um, we currently feel that it is safe to use hormone therapy within the first 10 years of menopause and start it before age 60. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you know, it's not a universal statement because everybody is different. Um, yeah. Another thing I just wanted to talk about is sometimes there have been studies and more recently studies that seem to correlate women who have um, bad, severe hot flashes um, ultimately develop heart disease. Um, any thoughts about that? You know, I, I wonder if the hot flashes, and I think this is where the science is going with the hot flashes and um, some of what we call vasomotor symptoms, um, night sweats, et cetera. Those may be a sign of a challenged vascular biology. Um, and so the, the blood vessels are responding um, in a way that that may actually be a signal um, that that there's something off with the vascular biology, and so there may be some sort of correlation there that that those women who experience hot flashes, like severe hot flashes or severe um, night sweats, might be actually showing us that they have additional increased risk for heart disease. So that much more that much more important that these women modify risk factors and monitor other symptoms. Interesting, but estrogen might help them, right? I mean, it definitely helps the vasomotor symptoms, right? Estrogen might help. Um, I think that there, we need to do a little bit more research at that um, cell level or the, the vascular level to see that, but we definitely see that in the, in the, um, that estrogen helps with uh, vascular function and vascular biology. Yeah, great. Okay, so we want to give our viewers some really important take-home messages. And some people have been asking that in the questions also. How do we, even at a young age, stay heart healthy? So let's talk a bunch of different things. Let's start diet. Diet, try to get as many vegetables, fruits, um, healthy fats, such as from um, nuts, olive oil, avocado, salmon, lean proteins, um, whole grains, and try to um, try to make sure you're eating from the rainbow, um, eating the least processed food that you can get your hands on. Now, believe me, we all live busy, busy lifestyles, so we're not always going to be perfect. Um, but try to try to eat uh, mainly from um, a wide color palette and um, and as whole food as you can get. Yeah. So there's a question in the in that came up. Um, 
you know, given the controversy about whether BMI really matters, how important is weight gain? How concerned should one be by gaining 20 pounds during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Good question, right? That's a great question and very relevant to probably most of the population. Um, any extra weight that you're carrying beyond what um, you're used to carrying is is going to be challenging um, from a cardiovascular standpoint and also for your bones and your um, joints. So um, whatever you can do to try to um, get back to moving, exercising, incorporating walking in your day-to-day -day even, and um, modifying what you're eating, um, that, that should help. For sure. So let's talk about those exercise recommendations. American Heart Association is really strict with the, what they want us to do, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so the American Heart Association has said um, per week about 75 minutes of uh, vigorous exercise, so that's 15 minutes of vigorous exercise five days a week. Um, and uh, uh, what was it? 150 minutes of moderate activity. Um, per week. So that's about 30 minutes of moderate activity, um, five days a week. What's vigorous, what's moderate, what's not. So moderate activity is actually not that hard to get. Um, moderate means that you go on a brisk walk, maybe, um, or a slow jog. Vigorous is getting into that running. Um, and what I explain to patients is that if you're able to sing, a song out loud, you're probably not exercising hard enough. If you're able to hold a conversation with um, short phrases, then you're probably in that moderate activity range. And if you're really panting and not able to get more than a couple of words out at a time, that's in the vigorous activity range. Uh, many of us live um, in areas that are walkable. So just get out and walk and try to. Um, some things that I've done, um, I have two kids, busy lifestyle, busy, you know, it's hard to kind of get that, like what we think we should be doing, getting, you know, on the treadmill or whatever, incorporate exercise in your day to day. So um, maybe make it part of your commute or make it part of your errands. And so know that when you're walking, try to walk at a more brisk pace. Um, and what I also recommend is that activity in um, counts if it's in at least 10 minute increments. So if your brisk walking lasts 10 minutes, but you split it, you do another 10 minutes and another 10 minutes, then that's getting pretty good activity um, during the day. I think trackers, fitness trackers are huge motivators. And, um, you know, I encourage encourage my patients to to do I do it myself I think it's a, a huge motivator to get those steps get the get your heart rate going yeah I, I have been a believer in the pedometer back when they were like these things that you latched <laughs> onto your belt <laughs> right <laughs> yeah all right but there are other lifestyle modifications that we should do for our heart health obviously no smoking reduce oh. the smoking um the alcohol is becoming um, a little bit more of a hot topic. Um, we, we generally recommend no more than one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men. I don't recommend starting al alcohol as you know, a way to lower one's cardiac risk because the science hasn't necessarily borne out that drinking alcohol reduces risk. We do see an association where light to moderate drinking is often associated with other healthy lifestyle um, components so that perhaps there is some association, but I don't recommend uh, that people start drinking just for their heart health. Um, and I also don't, I, and I also have seen, we see that there are adverse cardiac um, effects from having excessive alcohol. Mm -hmm. The other um, piece of this is, is sleep. Um, sleep is incredibly important. And um, being mindful of one's sleep habit and giving enough time to get sleep um, in a regular pattern each day, most adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep is super important. And finally, I'll recommend that 
women take time to settle one's mind. So like maybe incorporating a mindfulness or a stress reduction practice, easier said than done, but maybe even taking 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening to do some deep breathing exercises. Um, because this sort of attention to centering oneself or stress reduction has been shown to improve um, certain health parameters, including heart health. Yeah, we talk about those things so much with regards to all aspects of the menopause transition, um, finding stress management um, techniques and um, strategies for sleep. We did a whole webinar on sleep because it's such an important topic, but um, I fully believe in um, mindfulness practices. And you said 10 minutes. I sometimes say start with five because that's better than not doing anything actually. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I so this is, this is a really important pop-up point. Start somewhere, mm-hmm. make it a habit, and then increase. And may I say one more thing? Of course. <laughs> I think, and, and here's where I'm going to editorialize. <laughs> I think as women, we do so much for the people around us. We are often caring more for others than for ourselves. Take that time for yourself, number one. Number two, forgive yourself. It's not always going to be perfect every time. And just try your best. You know, trying is and, and, and getting somewhere is better than getting it perfect. Of course, we all strive for perfection. But, you know, making these steps incrementally is, is really important. Well, I was about to ask you for your final words of wisdom, but I think you just gave them to us. And I do think you're right. I think baby steps are so important. Set realistic goals that are achievable, and that'll give you the momentum to do more and get there. And I think um, I think you're so right about that. Do you have any other parting words, any other words of wisdom that you would like to share with us before we conclude? In, in addition to that, I'll say, listen to your bodies. And talk to your physicians openly um, about your concerns, your questions, um, and so that you can you can really take ownership and empower yourself to make the changes um, for your own health. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And this is all so individualized. So there are a lot of uh, questions that came up that are sort of very um, personal. I think you should speak with your provider about your individual circumstance because everybody goes through this menopause transition differently and everybody's risk factors are different. Yeah. Nevi, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of your wisdom that you shared with us this evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to talking to you again about this. Take care. That sounds great. Okay. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you.